Welcome to the lecture with the longest title in the course, at least so far. Partial molar quantities and the gibbs duhem equation. Let's come back to our friend the chemical potential. And I'm going to continue to work with two component solutions. And I expanded this equation in the last lecture. I'm going to emphasize again that the total differential involves chemical potentials times differentials in components plus VDP minus SDT if we're talking about the Gibbs free energy. And the chemical potential, remember, is defined as the partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the number of moles of quantity, but there's a little wrinkle compared to what we've seen before. And that wrinkle is that the things being held constant are not just temperature and pressure, but also the number of moles of other substances. So for a pure substance, that is when we were only considering one component, all we held constant was pressure and temperature. And so the partial molar free energy was the free energy of one mole of that substance. When we have a mixture, that is not necessarily the case anymore. That is, this value of the chemical potential for component J will depend on the number of moles of I. It will be a different value for 2 moles, 3 moles, 4 moles, whatever that might be. And we'll have to account for that when we work with chemical potentials. There are other partial molar quantities that we can define equivalently. And so consider volume. At constant pressure and temperature, volume's a function only of extensive variables. So it's homogeneous of degree one. And so Euler's theorem holds just as it did for free energy. I can again expand it, emphasizing this constant pressure and temperature. They're parameters of the function. And I'll have a derivative expression times a variable expression. All right, and so the partial molar volume is going to be defined in an exactly equivalent way. It is the partial derivative of the volume with respect to the substance, holding pressure and temperature constant, and holding whatever else stuff is there constant. And so once more, if it were the pure substance, the partial molar volume would be the volume in one mole of that substance. But it could just be something different when it's present in a mixture. So let, let's actually make that concrete. Let's look at a mixture. So here is a mixture of 1-propanol, or N-propanol, in water. So that is a mixture of two miscible liquids. They're miscible in all proportions. So I can take as much propanol, as much water as I'd like, and put them together. And so I'm plotting here the partial molar volume as a function of the mole fraction of propanol in the system. So if I'm over here at the right-hand side, 1, that's 100% propanol. If I'm over here at the left-hand side, that's 100% water. And notice, if we look at the propanol curve, the partial molar volume is changing as I go from having very, very little to being almost pure. And the same is true for water. As I start at pure water, I'll have whatever the molar volume of pure water is. And then it changes and it goes down a bit by the time I get to water being quite dilute. And so I'll let you uh, take a moment to work out a problem associated with this phenomenon. Normally I leave these slides for you to read the text and the explanation. This one I'm actually going to spend a moment on because it really helps to illustrate the concepts. So remember that the total volume is going to be equal to, and this is Euler's theorem in action, equal to number of moles of 1 times the partial molar volume of 1 plus number of moles of 2 times the partial molar volume of 2. So pure n-propanol over here looks like it has a volume of about, mm, call that 73 milliliters. Pure water, on the other hand, over at the left-hand side, mm, about 18 milliliters. If I go to the indicated mixture, which was 
0.9 of one quantity and 0.1, so 0.9 water and 0.1 mole fraction of propanol. I would read this off and plug it into this equation as 0.9, that is the number of moles of water times the molar volume, partial molar volume. It doesn't look like it's changed much, about 18. I come up here to the propanol curve. I've got 0.1 moles of uh, propanol times what looks to be about 71 if I interpret it there. And when I add that together, I'll get 23.3 milliliters. So that is the total volume that that mixture occupies. But note that had I taken originally the, the volume of water, whether it was pure water or not, no real difference here. But if I had poured together 16.2 milliliters of water and 7.3 milliliters of, of n-propanol, that is how many milliliters there are in 0.9 moles of water. So that's 0.9 times this 18. And where did I get this 7.3 from? It's by taking 73 milliliters as the volume of the pure substance. So 0.1 moles of the pure substance would be a tenth of that, 7.3. I took 16.2 and 7.3, total 23.5, but when I poured them together, they're down to 23.3. All right, so the total volume's contracted a bit when I made that mixture. And that's because the partial molar volume of the propanol depended on the quantity of water. And ultimately, at uh, high propanol concentrations, we'd have seen water change a bit. So an important example that illustrates that mixtures do not have the same volume as the sum of the volumes of the two pure things being mixed. All right. Well, let's continue then. All, all extensive quantities have partial molar equivalents. So we've seen the free energy, but there are also uh, enthalpy and entropy equivalents. So we can talk about the partial molar enthalpy, the partial molar entropy, and they're all defined equivalently. They would be determined as variation with respect to quantity when holding quantities of other substances constant. But let's come back to the Gibbs free energy. And again, let's work at constant pressure and temperature. So that's the sort of key equation, the operative equation. But we also know from Euler's theorem that the total free energy is N1 mu1 plus N2 mu2. So let me do a general differentiation of that. So when I take dg, it's N1 d mu plus mu1 dn and n2 d mu 2 plus mu 2 d n2. Right, so that's just you know, taking a full differential of a product. So this I got from doing a total differential of g holding p and t constant. So here's the same term here, mu 1 d n 1. And here's the same term here, mu 2 d n 2. They're both d g with p and t held constant. And so that means these extra two terms that are left over down here in this second equation, they must add to zero. So n1 d mu1 plus n2 d mu2 is equal to zero. And that's critically important because it gives us a handle on relating the chemical potential of one substance to the chemical potential of another substance. So if we take that uh, last expression, and let's just divide by the total number of moles in the system. In which case, I'll get number of moles of 1 divided by total number of moles. That's the mole fraction of 1. And similarly for 2, I get mole fraction 1 d mu 1 plus mole fraction 2 d mu 2 is equal to 0. And that is the gibbs duhem equation. And it applies at constant temperature and pressure. And so again, I'm going to emphasize the, the critical utility of that equation, which we will have occasion to use in the next few lectures. If you know how one chemical potential is varying as a function of the composition of the solution, which is dictated by the mole fractions, then you know what the corresponding change must be in the other chemical potential because the sum of those two must be equal to zero. Okay, so if you can measure one easily, and maybe not the other, that gives you a handle on the other. Well, let's put that into action soon. And in particular, let's start looking at multi-component and multi-phase equilibria.